Welcome back to Questing Beast. Today we're going to look at the Lapis Observatory by Jacob Hurst. It's a small dungeon and there's a lot of interesting features about it that I want to point out. But I would like to point out that I actually bought this about six months ago or so, and I didn't make a review of it because only 50 of them were ever printed. These were handmade by Jacob. And as a result, no one else could buy them uh, once they sold out, so making a review would be a little bit pointless. However, What's happened in the last uh, couple days is that the setting that this dungeon is from, which is called Hot Springs Island, has just been kickstarted. So if we like what we see in here, then that kickstart might be a good thing to look at. Um, I'm not being paid by Jacob. Um, I'm just a huge fan of the stuff that he's made, and I want more people to see the features that this dungeon has. I think they set a nice um, example for how to make dungeons and a good high watermark for what I would like to see coming out of the OSR scene. One nice thing about this is, as you can tell, it has this beautiful um, gold shine to the letters. Look at that. You see that on the cover, and we can even see it on the inside here, um, where he has hand gilded the letters. Um, so this is one of the 15 dungeons found on Hot Springs Island, which is a large tropical hex crawl setting that uh, Jacob has uh, is trying to publish through Kickstarter. It is system neutral, which means that it does not contain any stats at all. So you can use it for any fantasy um, system that you like. You'll have to add your own stats to the monsters, but the lack of stats does make it easier to read. It makes it feel like a piece of world building rather than a game, which is actually really nice. The Swordfish Islands is the archipelago, and the Hot Springs Island is one island on it, where the um, book is going to take place. So the Lapis Observatory, um, this is elven themed. It was an elven observatory for studying the universe, but as elven society crumbled and became more and more decadent, the observatory was used for giant parties, essentially, and uh, revelry. And, uh, but once a giant disaster struck the archipelago, then um, it's a little bit unexplained in here, though I expect the main book will flesh it out. All of the elves who were on a big drug binge uh, were transformed into orange sludge, which now roams around the corridors of the Lapis Observatory. So you'll be running into those guys. So it's uh, system neutral. So there's no stats for monsters or prepackaged treasure parcels. No levels are assumed, and there are no expected or correct path of advancement through this dungeon. In addition to the entrance on the ground floor, balconies and windows can provide skilled climbers with access to the second and third floors from outside the tower. So this is very open, very sandboxy. It assumes players who are going to want to make their own way through it. And if we look at the actual dungeon itself, we'll find that although each floor is well explained, there are no encounters listed for it because you're expected to use this to create your own encounters. When you first show up, um, when the party first shows up at the observatory, you roll 3d6 and you find an in, uh, instigating event, I suppose you could call it. Um, for example, the tower is lit for a party, music plays, fireworks at night, auto party magic is functional. Or you might find something like, um, an elf is hosting D4 extra planar business associates in the observatory. Or a rock roosts atop the observatory. So something to change it up every time you play. You got a global encounter table of different things that you will typically find in the observatory and what their motivations are. And of course, you can roll these separately and combine them to create all sorts of different encounters. Here's some great features of the way that this is laid out and presented to us. On each floor, we have an encounter table. So you can use those random encounters from the previous page and write them in here and you'll be ready to go. You can create one for each room, or you could even just create a random encounter table to roll on every 10 minutes like you do in old school games. Um, we have nice big chunky numbers to easily find the different sections of this basement. And then we have all the descriptions on the facing page. No flipping necessary. You got the picture, you got the descriptions right here. That's a great attention to layout. What's especially great though, is the way that each description is designed. And this is very rare to see descriptions organized like this. What we see is that it's a paragraph of text, but certain uh, words and phrases are bolded. Those are the things that pop out immediately. When a player enters that area, you just look at the bold words and you tell them, here's what you see right off the bat. 
when the players want to examine that in more detail, then you can look at the words and descriptions in parentheses following the bolded words. That's like zooming in to your description when they get take a closer look. So this allows you to skim each of the rooms very quickly and have a, a good grasp of what's there, what players are going to see. You don't have to read through the entire paragraph and then try and digest it and figure out what they would see right off the bat when they enter a room. You just know, you just look at the bold words. That's fantastic. The ground floor here, this is the main floor that you're gonna come in. Secret passages there are going down to the basement. We have some nice little uh, descriptions of the different rooms. So I love this one at number two. As you walk through the main entrance, um, you're walking into this room, it's like walking into space. Walls, floor, and ceiling are enchanted with magic to allow highly detailed lifelike depictions of galaxies, nebulas, supernovae, uh, pulsars, comets, and asteroids and planets. The scenes depicted on, are on a 72 hour loop. Room is otherwise empty with no apparent exits. And then a hologram appears and asks if you would like to enter the Lapis Observatory. The whole place is uh, swarming with orange sludge, which was the uh, what used to be the elves that were partying here. And they've left a deep crust of orange crystal behind themselves wherever they go. The, the slime hardens into crystal over time, although it melts again if it's exposed to sunlight. So this place is quite dark, but it's coated in crystal, which has preserved most of the opulence and the gold and the treasures that used to be here. They're all preserved under the crystallized sludge, which you have to dig through. Gift shops, drinkers' libraries, smoker den, uh, dusters' gymnasiums. So we have a wide variety of types of rooms that we can find here. Jagged crystal columns. We have a kitchen full of food. We have a wide ballroom here where there's a big mirror covering that side of the of the ballroom. And sludges are hypnotized by their own reflections, especially since this mirror offers a idealized um, reflection of yourself. It echoes the elves of vanity, I suppose. So when the sludges look into the mirror, they see a perfected form of themselves back when they were elves and they're hypnotized by it. We have a gold arch here teleporting you to the third floor, which has all sorts of rooms around the edge here. And you can roll on this table to see what's in them, or you can simply pick them yourself. For example, we might have things like an overgrown private patio decorated with exhibits of impossible weather, limestone hearths in a library of mechanical songbirds, screens of wooden pearls hide embroidered cotton tents, 1,000 floating lanterns hang above soil-filled pits, a squash court of glowing petals, a dance floor decorated with distorted golden statuary. So, crazy elven opulence might be a good name for this adventure altogether. And like I said, there aren't any monsters actually listed here, but due to what you're going to be rolling on your random encounters, then you'll have all sorts of interesting interactions, not necessarily violent ones, because you'll have monsters who are transporting things somewhere else or just in a conversation with someone or have are pursuing some need of their own. So you'll, there will be a lot of opportunities for interaction. You have the fourth floor, which is overgrown with, with all sorts of uh, strange plants. Those are described later on in the book. Jacob does a great job coming up with crazy, weird plants, which is something that a lot of adventurers really don't take into account. Opalized forest, the dead oak full of an, with an insane dryad inside. We have an acorn of Yggdrasil lying over there. The fifth floor is the floor of the uh, observatory itself. So if you sit in this chair and you manage to take control of it, then the ceiling, which is the, the dome of the fifth floor, will turn into, let's see here, only visible when the star chair is in use, the dimensional map of the galaxy and the top layer of D10 plus 3 populated planes of existence are shown. Known portal locations, accurate as of several thousand years ago, light up and provide information on how to reach that destination. What the inhabitants buy and sell, account of known elven deaths at the location, and basic survivability requirements. So this is an observatory the elves were using to explore the multiverse. And of course, you can use it for your own ends if you manage to make it this far. You can zoom in and rotate and learn more about whatever universe you're exploring here. So we have an example of some of the creatures 
that are featured in here. No stats, like I said, but good detailed descriptions. It includes what they want and what they do not want, which is great because that way you know how to run them in a very succinct form. Reminds me a bit of what we've seen in um, Maze of the Blue Medusa. Alabaster Guardians, we've got some weird plants like the salt vine, for example, which is a plant with these crystals, these salt crystals growing out of it, and it sucks all the moisture out of the air in the surrounding area. So if you're not careful, it will suck all the moisture out of you. Sapopa, which is the drug plant that elves like using, which enhances their magical abilities. Amber moss, which if you touch can intoxicate you with all sorts of crazy effects. For example, your vision is inverted or you are struck blind whenever you attempt to do something significant. The rest of the time, everything is tinged orange. What else? <laughs> you are compelled to vocalize every thought. All the time and in any circumstance, no matter how petty or inappropriate it may be. You have severe narcolepsy. So roll in the Amber Moss effects table and have a good time. Your players will certainly have a fun time trying to deal with it. Monsters, astral spinners, crazy spiders from another dimension. Blind fire vines, bolt foragers, these crazy birds with a big spike on their foreheads. They're carcass eaters. Crystal frogs, I love this little guy. It's a magical construct capable of reproducing. These tiny frogs of clear, angular crystal are usually no longer than a human thumb. The frogs will bond with intelligent creatures, similar to a mundane dog or cat, and a tidy, tiny beating heart within changes color to match its owner's mood. Instead of croaking like a normal frog, crystal frogs twitter and chirp like a nightingale. Crystal frogs enjoy being bonded with an intelligent creature that will give them attention. If a frog has chosen to stay with a creature and feels well treated, it can heal its owner of one disease, cure, or poison each day by singing a special song in their ear. So everyone's going to be getting a crystal frog. Muttering serpent, a serpent that always looks like you. So every player that looks at it will see his own head attached to the serpent before its jaw unhinges to eat them. Great way to terrify your players. Orange sledges, what they want, what they don't want. Tortured um, elves in sludge form wanting to return to their former selves. Singing golems, there's a lot of golems in the Lapis Observatory. And they are the keys to opening up a lot of doors, since the elves tended to use magical um, sounds and chimes in order to unlock locks. We have an, an NPC party that you can throw at your players if they are also exploring the observatory. And they're, they're very flavorful. These guys have a lot of personality to them. These aren't your typical fighters um, or wizards or rogues or whatever. They, they have a unique personality. And I appreciate that a lot. For example... Ah, Claire the Wizard. The first apprentice to a powerful wizard flung to Hot Springs Island when her spell was interrupted by witch hunters. Claire has platinum blonde hair, green eyes, and a terrible sunburn that her tattered blue-gray robe and floppy green palm frond hat do little to prevent. She was attempting to summon a creature to protect herself and her master from witch hunters, but Neville, one of the hunters, disturbed her in the spell's final moments, and the two were flung to this remote place. They overcame their differences in order to survive, and after a series of adventures have fallen in love. In addition to an exceptional intellect, Claire wields an ancient elven spellbook she found in the ruins of Hot Spring City and a slim metal wand of lightning. Selection of elven treasures. This is a great example of what magical treasure should look like. Because this system, um, or because this book is system neutral, there aren't any plus ones to strength or extra attacks. Um, instead, they all provide unique effects that seem weird or maybe useless, unless you play your cards right, in which case they become very useful. And that's exactly how I like my magic items. So one of my favorites is this one, uh, Daphne's Vambrace, a delicate decorative gold gauntlet. Any article of clothing or outfit, but not jewelry, touched by the gauntlet will be consumed and stored in the gauntlet, I assume. If the wearer says, clothe me, the gauntlet will dress them in something fresh and stylish. Up to 65 tons of clothing can be stored this way, and the glove can vomit forth a torrent of clothing the wearer has stored, but now considers outdated. Once expelled, however, the gauntlet will refuse to consume the, those clothes again for the wearer's own good. You could even use this as a weapon. Imagine if you're being chased by a bunch of brigands, and you just turn on your uh, vambrace, and you fire 65 tons of old clothing at them. That's hilarious. We have an embroidered blood coat. A coat that you put on in which you can't turn off or can't take off 
until it has been completely soaked in human blood and absorbs about 10 humans worth of blood. They're all like that. Just great little items. And that's the end of it there. So this is a great example of dungeon design. It asks you to put in a little bit of work because you have to figure out the encounters for each room. But the way that each of the rooms is designed with the bold words and then the uh, parentheses words for the more detailed description is such a fantastic way of showing what is in each room that I just wish everyone would do it. Um, I like the art. The art is all has a very unified style to it. And I like what I've seen in the examples from the Kickstarter full book. The, the full book that I've seen on Kickstarter looks unusual. There's two books. One is going to be a game master's book and one is going to be a player's guide. And the player's guide is a field guide to Hot Springs Island is what it's called. And all the players can read it and it's an in-world artifact written in journal notes. So the players can read it and get clues and adventure hooks to things that are happening around the island. The books also are, look like they have incredibly high production quality. Uh, they're being smith sewn, similar to Maze of the Blue Medusa, and um, they just look gorgeous. They look like something that you would love to have on your shelf, even if you didn't play RPGs. So if you love dungeon design, if you like good art, if you like excellent um, item design, if you want beautiful books, then please check out um, Hot Springs Island, the hex crawl for Swordfish Island being put out by Jacob Hurst. This little preview of it really shows you what you might be getting once that is actually finished. Thanks for watching my channel. If you'd like to see more videos like this, you can subscribe right over here and see more old school role-playing game reviews. You can join me on Patreon over here if you'd like to support me making videos like this. And uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys later.